Um, I'm not going to talk about all the things that you said I was going to talk about, because I know you have uh, some of it for you to read in the book. Um, in fact, I, I was trying to figure out what it was that I was going to talk about tonight, and I thought, well, well first maybe I could talk about Mary, um, who sold her illicit favors to the soldiers at one point and was kicked off the island for that. Or I could talk about Miss Libby, who uh, made cakes for the Confederate soldiers who were imprisoned on the island during the Civil War. Or I could talk about uh, Wilbur Wright, who made the first flight across American waters from Governor's Island. And that was 100 years, and, um, I think two weeks from today, or 1909, <laughs> September. And or I could talk about the Smothers, the Smothers Brothers. They were born in a hospital on Governor's Island. Um, I could talk about skyscrapers, since we're in the Skyscraper Museum, but there are no skyscrapers on Governor's Island. So what I decided to do was, um, I thought about this venue, and I thought about the exhibits that Carol has mounted here. And in all of them, although she's talking about skyscrapers, she also talks about the context of those skyscrapers and the planning for what goes on around the skyscrapers. And I thought to myself, well, um, Governor's Island is not an urban setting. It's much more of a uh, small town setting. But there was planning and there was engineering. And that t particular time was from uh, 1900 to 1940. And that's, although I'm not going to, I'll give you a little bit about the history so you can get, you know, that context. But basically those are the years that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, the, uh, I'm going to talk about, let's see, I'm going to talk about the um, military and Beaux-Arts plans that were put forth during this period. And I'm also going to talk about a unique engineering feat. And these provide what are the bones of Governor's Island today. And you'll see how that all kind of fits together. So let me tell you the history. Just a little bit of history. If you want to get the real history, there's a timeline in the book. It's about four pages long. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the whole history. Um, the island was founded by the Dutch in 1624. Yeah. And uh, there were few men who were who landed on the island. So this was the very, very first first boat that came from Holland. And um, then they left for New York for the city from Manhattan and they left some cows on the island. And they thought this would be a great place just to leave the cows. However, there was no grazing. There were only nut trees. And so very quickly they had to move the cows to Manhattan. Um, then the island was tossed back and forth between the British military the Re American Revolutionary soldiers, and then American uh, and sorry, British and New York state governors. This was until 1800. So that's a whole history that gets you get it in pieces because the, each chapter restarts the chronology. So altogether, there is a lot of the older history there. Uh, in 1800. The state granted title, and that was the, the island was owned by the state, which was it was given to the state by the British, and then, then the Americans got it, and uh, it was given to the U federal government in 1800 and for use by the army, and it stayed as a military reservation until 19 uh, about 80 sorry 98. And uh, the, the Army moved out in 1965, Coast Guard moved in in 1965, and they, they left in 19, uh, sorry, <laughs> 1998. Um, there was a sort of discussion about what was going to happen to the island after that, and I'm sure you over time read about this in the, uh, in the, in the newspaper, you know, shall we sell it to the highest bidder, shall we turn it into a park, shall we make it a casino, so we put large apartments in, in, on the island. And uh, in the end, uh, President Clinton granted the island to the city and the state. It's run by the city and the state uh, for a dollar. And that happened finally in 2003. Have any of you been out there recently? Mm -hmm. 
and here you have a deep harbor, deep water harbor, and this would be a perfect place to have the army, central army shipping base coming from Governor's Island. Um, so planning, okay, with these problems in the open, planning began. Next. Ellen Hugh Root, who had become Secretary of the Army in 1899, a year later charged a panel of high-ranking military men to prepare a plan to answer the following question. Should Governor's Island be retained, abandoned, or enlarged? And does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah. <laughs> And curiously, you'll find in the book this happened over and over and over again. Um, every time there was no money for the army, they decided they were going to get rid of it. They, the the um, assessed value went up each time they decided they were going to get rid of it. It was amazing. So if it were to be kept, Root said, that the, uh, the group should propose housing for a battalion of troops. Right now, only or heretofore, only a regiment, which is a much smaller body of men had lived on the island, and many of them lived in tents. The uh, report was also to provide storage and shipping space for all branches of the army. So you had a hospital, you, you, so you, had, you needed something for the medical, you needed something for ordnance. The ordnance provided the food and the uh, uniforms for the soldiers, and for the Army Corps of Engineers, those were the engineers that were in charge of keeping the, the island in physical good order, etc. And there's also an underlying boosterism. Um, it was very hard to get people to um, be officers in the army and want to live on Governor's Island. I mean, particularly given those descriptions. So um, if you could make this a beautiful place, um, the, the officers would want to be interested there. So I won't go into the plan was, that was approved by Root, uh, because most, there were no, no images in that. It was all writing. Uh, but it was approved in less than a year. And at the end of 1900, uh, th there were a lot of details, but I'm only going to say, talk to two parts of the report, which were, uh, which were addressed. One was building roads on the other end of the island. And the increase, second was increasing the acreage by placing landfill on the southern part of the island. So I'm going to concentrate on that. So in 1901, Secretary of War Ellie Hugh Root hired Charles McKim, the firm of Char Charles, Charles McKim of the firm, a prestigious firm of McKim, Mead, and White. And Charles McKim himself actually worked on the early plans. Um, and he asked them to design a master plan for the entire island that would include landfill. This was unusual, as such work was usually done by in-house and according to, to standardized military plans and everything was exactly the same. Um, Bruce was very interested, however, in beautification. And under his auspices, there were several army bases that uh, had, uh, he, where he hired um, important art architects, namely, for example, uh, Olmsted did the Presidio in California. So his let me just read you the letter, his letter to uh, McKim. Dear sirs, or to the firm, the government proposes to make extensive changes in Governor's Island. The structures proposed will necessarily make a great change in the appearance of the island. And the island is so conspicuous in the harbor of New York that I am very anxious to have the changes made in good taste and to have them render the island an object which will contribute contribute to the beauty of the harbor instead of marring it. In three years, that's what was happening. So we have three plans that were produced between 1901 and 1906 by the McKim firm. In, in, in these, you can see not only what the architects hoped to achieve, but to determine the pattern that formed the island's eventual development. So we start <coughs> here. We've got, um, oh, best thing. McKim immediately said, we have to get rid of the castle and the jet. Huh? <laughs> Lots of stones here. We can use them to make the border of the land. Well, these buildings were by then 100 years old, and, and they had taken a lot of effort to make and to build. And, and this was actually 
actually a very unique structure. I'm not going into the architecture of that. You have it if you go over to the island and visit the uh, National Monument. Um, but there was a hue and cry, and Ellie Hugo said, no, Nick's back, didn't happen. Um, so um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, what you see here is um, the uh, porch and I don't even see the cat. I think the castle's down here. But the, 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 the castle suddenly becomes less. I mean, they, they in, in fact, in the, in the descriptions, the verbal descriptions of it, the castle isn't even talked about, nor is the prison talked about. So that, um, you know, I don't think they were very happy about having, but McKim was not happy about having the prison there on the island. But the uh, Fort J was to house the regiment. And um, there were, there was to be, there's a pier here on the north, Another one that was going to be the arrival pier. This is going to be the probably the uh, one for the shipping, but it's not very big. And then housing in different um, configurations again for. Uh, wait a minute. You know what? I know what the problem is. This is upside down, oh, yes. and, yeah. and, and it, that's the way it is. That's the way it came out. Mm -hmm. um, so the the castle, the castle is there, and it is there. Yeah, and yeah. it's reversed. So this was Nolan Park. Nolan Park is wiped out. All of this wonderful yellow Victorian buildings gone. And he, he made new housing here for the officers and then other housing and uh, along the end there. And then this was this is facing Buttermilk Channel and that was all of the industrial area. And that sets the pattern for what is there today. The industrial area actually stayed there under the army, it really was very, very active during the First and Second World War. And then the, let's go to the next slide, it'll be easier to see this. And then, um, the, there, we've got it on the other side now. So the, the, this is the um, industrial was over there. And then the Coast Guard built that industrial area up, up further and built three piers there. So, and that's what you see there today, that there's some of those, those buildings are still existing. Uh, Guy Beck is like beginning to tear down some of them, but, but they are still there. Um, so here you see, this is a 1906 plan that was shown on the cover of Scientific American, and it's a, a bird's eye view, so you get a little more of a sense of what, what they have proposed. Um, they proposed a very large pier, it was an L-shaped pier, and then more piers over there. So this you know, this was for the major major army shipping. Plan. In fact, all they got built was a T-shaped pier. This didn't go here. Instead, instead of being L-shaped, it was T-shaped, and the other piers were not did not, did not happen. Um, you've got in the center of Fort J. You had a large reservoir because although water had uh, was now coming in from Brooklyn, I think that started in about the 1870s. Uh, they were afraid that that might stop and they needed to have their own source of water in case there was an emergency. And what's still, you know, all sorts of housing around the edges, uh, trees going across the center of the island. And oh, one of the things I had mentioned before, there was always a monument. In the Beaux-Arts plans, there were always monuments. And the monument was in line with Fort J. And it's a little bit askew because Fort Jay was not exactly in the center of the island, so it wasn't quite as formal or, or as precise as, as those, those art plans were. Um, but here, this is the thing. They needed housing for the regiment, for the uh, battalion. The regiment and officers could still live in Fort Jay, but this was the design for a massive building that went across the bottom of the island that could house It is as green as grass can make it, 
and a landscape architect in artist in charge must know his business. So um, while the while the designers were at work, the engineers actually built out the landfill and the new land that was being planned in abstract. This would be the largest single landfill in New York City. It was bigger than Battery Park City and uh, its construction took 12 years and came in on budget. <laughs> so this, this slide is a, are soundings that were taken by Colonel W.L. Marshall. I never found his first name. His, his, his name was never in here. It was always W.L. Marshall. And he was with the Army. He was a high echelon person in the Army Corps of Engineers. And he was put in charge of building the landfill, designing and building it. And what he found in these uh, soundings was that the depth around the edges ranged from one foot to 26 feet. And it was deep mud. Uh, normally, when you when you build buildings in New York, you, you put down your, your 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 base, and it comes in onto rock. That you need to get it deep enough in order to set it into rock. There was no rock. I mean, it was too deep to work to do anything with that, and it would have been too expensive. What they normally did was to put in pilings, wood pilings, and then build a wall around the pilings, and then dump the rocks into that. The rocks would come up, go all around the island, and then you could fill on the other side of that on the inside. But this was too deep and too expensive to do this, so the engineers thought, well, we'll try something new. Let's dump the rocks directly into the water. And this was very new for New York. And they did just that. Those rocks are still there today. And some of those walls are still there today. And this became a new technology for the city. And much of the Brooklyn waterfront has that same technology. So they invented something new. Um, where did it come from? Next slide, please. Let me ask that question. Where did it come from? Well, they were building the IRT subway at that time. And the subway was very happy to get, not to have to pay terribly much to get rid of all of that rock that was coming out. So the subway people had hired a firm by the name of Toomey Brothers. And the army hired the Toomey Brothers to bring what they took out underground in Manhattan out to the island. So we are, I can't quite see where it is, but here it is. Yeah, here it is. That's the, that's the island. And so here the, the um, subway hole is here. Railroad tracks brought, it brought the rocks out. Barges came here and took it right across the four minute ride. No big deal. Is that um, East River Drive? No, no, that's a, that's a railroad <coughs> track that was built only for both taking the stones out and so much. We've got, what are we here? This is a uh, um, battery park. Oh, so we get to battery park. And if you look, yeah. here, yeah. you see two structures floating on the water. Guess what those are? Floating pools. <laughs> <laughs>
contract to dredge buttermilk channel. So on this side, they could use pumps and just pump the, the fill over the walls, the stone walls. And on this side, they had to bring it in by barge, and they used clamshell diggers to take the dirt from the barge and dump it in, into the island. The only trouble was that as far as on, on the buttermilk channel side, very often they missed and they put everything back in the water. <laughs> on the uh, Governor's Island side, they also missed because the clamshell, first of all, they sometimes, they, they didn't work, so they sort of dumped it right into the water. And secondly, the arms of the clamshells were too short to reach over the rocks. And, um, you know, it just sort of like spilled all over. Uh, what ended up happening is they had to pile up the dirt on the sides and then they brought in machines and they had to bring the dirt to the center and they had to dig it. So this was very, very labor intensive at the time, but not terribly expensive. Quick question? Yes. This is for orientation. On Governor's Island now, there's a building called South Battery. Um, it's right there. Okay. So and so behind it was part of the areas that were kind of messy and yes. Exactly. And so the wall was so all of that, so that land behind there are headed towards the Verrazano Narrows Bridge right, exactly. is now what's part of that land. That's, land That's correct. And if you okay. went out there and you saw the view of the Statue of Liberty yep. recently, you were right here. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful story about this. Also, you see how nice and rounded this is? The, uh, the original plan for this was this kind of pointy thing. And um, Kim Lee and White said, oh, no, no. It must be rounded, it must be elegant. And that required the army to go to the state to get extra land allotted to them, lands underwater allotted to them. And that's the story, it's in here too. It's a whole political story about this. So anyway, they had to fill in from four to 10 feet deep. Um, they used 4.5 million feet of dirt. That's one third more than the yards you placed at Battery Park City. Um, there were delays, I talked about that. Um, next, please. This is a photograph by Underwood taken from a, a high rise building in, the heart, in uh, Manhattan. Oh. And you can see the, the island is, uh, the, the build is nearly finished. You can see a little bit of work going on at the, on the far side. On the, on the, uh, of it, not quite finished. Um, on January 13, 13 years after the initial landfill proposal, 103.55 acres, one story above mean high tide, were turned over to the Army. The cost was $10,300 per acre, but that's in 1900. Uh, a New York Times description. It is almost certainty that 10 years hence, there will be in New York Harbor <coughs> the finest military post in the whole world. <laughs> there will be great headquarters buildings on it, splendid mansions, and imposing barracks. There will be a splendid park and a great athletic field. Next, please. But the plans remained on the shelf for several decades. Uh, during this period, uh, when they were building the landfill from 1902 to 1905, the Army built uh, the quartermaster quarter designed houses on the existing land north of the landfill. And these are the red brick buildings that you might have seen when you were over there. Um, and in fact, next please. At the turnover of the landfill, all that was on the landfill was a new fog light, and there's a story about that fog, fog light in the book. Uh, everything was in fight, everything, no, nothing was The remnants of an airplane shed, and, this, and the engineer's last field house. Next, please. So everything stopped, and the dream of elegant structures was replaced by prefab, prefab reality. But I'm going to digress for one minute because there's a, another interesting short story about this one. In 1918, as they were building these, hastily erecting these 
prehab structures, uh, the Army built the island's second incinerator. The first was built in 1855, it was near Castle Clinton, and it was the first incinerator in the world. And it was called the crematorium. So all of the maps of that period say the crematorium. At first I thought, well, you know, that's where they found the dead people. <laughs>
had this plant, which I discovered in the, underneath a whole bunch of leukemia and white plants. It's like Eureka. And they were suggesting that, and so this was the army officers, it was not the McKim plan. They were suggesting that they build the, the regimented uh, or the battalion building on Buttermilk Channel. And the, what they said was that it would provide cool breezes and also the site offered a grand view of the harbor. Now, if in fact the McKim plan was done after this, then the argument that it was built to stop the airport is, would be logical. I don't know, I was not able to find that out. But so that, that's sort of an unknown story, or the, the solution to that story. Um, let's see, next please. Do you want to write about this? Well, I think to make up the current one. So with federal funds finally available in 1930, in 22 months, how long does it take to build buildings here in New York today? Today, five years. Empire State Building, 13 months. Uh, okay, so this is longer than the Empire State Building. The Army constructed probably the longest building the world designed in the world, designed so, solely for the shelter of soldiers. It's longer than the height of the Chrysler Building. Wow. Next, please. Uh, the Depression and WA, well, WPA funds finally allowed some of the beautification to happen on the island. Uh, the WPA workers built um, all of the pathways that you probably were able to, if you were walking on the, the in, inner part of the island, first, particularly the northern part, um, these were built then. And they used um, the, uh, they used uh, cannonballs as, as sidewalk markers. And, and those you can still see today. They're um, Robert Moses contributed trees from the uh, Parks Department, and those trees are still on the island. And um, next, please. <coughs> and the multi story apartment houses were began to be built, and they were along the water, uh, just along the um, on, on one side. In fact, it's very much according to the plan that you just saw before. Uh, the Army in the 1940s finally allowed soldiers to get married. So, and before only officers could be married, and they, they lived on the island of the families, mainly in uh, Fort Jay. But once the, they allowed soldiers to get married, they had to find housing for them. And so that's what these houses all began to go up. And you'll see all of the red brick buildings in the North End were built in the 1930s. And then next, please. And then that's another one of those. In fact, I think this is very similar to what you can't put this hospital that was built by McKinney and White um, on the island that is now becoming the Harbor School. Next. Which island is that? The Army? On the island that's becoming the Harbor School. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then in the 1960s and 70s, there was such a demand, and when the Coast Guard came, for more housing that they put in, they built these high-rise buildings that are there today, and we want very badly to those are all on the land. What happened to that factory that the new was situated on the island? That's cover thing? That's the, the jig, the cover thing? Well, that's true. That's, that's, the snow. It's not, it's it's not, not true. true. Yeah, well, that's what she did. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's not true. It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> yeah. They didn't have a factory there? No, the whole thing is, is a joke. It's meant to be a joke. <laughs> you know, I, the problem is the way it's done. Uh -huh. In fact, when I saw it, somebody, somebody sent me pictures of it. What is this? Uh -huh. And it's, it's meant, it's tongue in cheek. It's meant to be tongue in cheek. It's done, it was done by the same Dutch group that has been doing all of the work out there in the last, the last couple of weeks. Um, next, please. <laughs>
industrial uh, buildings are on the right. Next. And so this is the map of today. And you can see, and, and now the screen space goes all the way down to here. And uh, this, all of this esplanade has been open to all of you who might have liked. And um, it's, um, there's, uh, the ho as I said, the hospital is going to be a charter school. Actually, that's, that's, that's going to be open in fall of 1910, next fall. That's a charter school that now exists in Brooklyn. It, it, it is harvest school. It's teaching kids to throw oysters and to sail and to be on the water. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, eventually maybe become a merchant marine or whatever. And um, what's interesting is that where they are right now in Brooklyn is as far away from the water as any <laughs> place in New York. <laughs> so they're very excited to be coming there. And there's in here, somewhere it's around, up, up where that circle is, it's to the south of that circle, there's a small pier that they built where they actually are growing oyster culture already. So it's going to be very exciting. Um, so the uh, guy pick is now uh, working on, on plans for building out the park. The agreement with the uh, federal government for getting Governor's Island, <coughs> or giving it to a city and the state, uh, requires that 40 acres of the of Governor's Island remain as parkland. Next, please. Is the Harvard School going to be residential, or is it? No, high school. This is the plan by West Eight. It's, it's actually much bigger than you see here, but it's uh, this is the tip of the, no, this is the uh, Hudson River side of the island. So that you get they're going to hopefully have uh, elevations there where you can get up and you can see the harbor, you know, the vista of the entire harbor. So as you look at the West Eight plans, you can almost feel the sentiments of a journalist, journalist who was writing in 1891. The soil is naturally good. When improved into walks, roads, and gardens, it cannot otherwise than consent to the delightful scene of recreation. We may expect soon to see it metamorphosed from a neglected spot to a seat of taste and rural elegance. Thank you.